Literatuurlijk Symposium podcast of de Geops Lustrum. I am Frederik Prins from the Symposium Committee and this is Rewired. We are very happy to present to you today the first podcast of the Lustrum Symposium Week. Due to COVID, everybody will be a bit sad to be celebrating the holidays with less friends and family than usual. That is why we are starting off the Symposium Week on this day to cheer you up as a gift on the birthday of Sinterklaas. In consultation with the Sint, of course. Today, our guest will be Philippe Samin from Salmon and Partners. We will be talking about the first zero carbon base on Antarctica. At the end of the interview, there was some time for some other members of the committee to ask some interesting questions. First of all, welcome, and uh, we're very happy to join us for our podcast today. Um, so what I thought we could do today is uh, first uh, talk about your design processes and then talk about the project we're going to talk about, it, uh, going into it in detail. Uh, so today we're talking about the Princess Elizabeth base that you worked on. Um, uh, it's a, a base in Antarctica, so it's very interesting. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what you do and what you're specialized in? Okay, so I'm specialized in questioning why are we doing things. Right? And the first thing we have to remember, that modestly as architects and engineers, is that we dramatically lack of imagination, that we should fight against our fear of unknown. Unknown is the most beautiful thing you can imagine because you don't know it yet. So my question is permanently asking myself, why are we doing something? And <coughs> it's, a, it's a determinated process. It's a why, but with a goal, you know, it's we, we, we first have to, to think in which direction we want to go and then put all the questions around it. So the design process here is as transversal as possible. And um, I'm writing and, you know, uh, I'm 72. So I run some partners for 40 years. And when we created the company, uh, June 20, 1980, uh, after five years uh, uh, already uh, uh, working uh, without a, a company uh, structure, I decided that I would run the company for 40 years as the concierge manager, plus designing everything. And after 40 years, that I would leave the management to other partners and I would only do the, the continue focusing only on the design. So I'm now since June 20, 20, 000, uh, 2020, a uh, happy man because I'm only busy with design and uh, calculation. Uh, so I have more time to talk with students, with colleagues, and uh, to uh, write the fundamentals. So I didn't wait uh, two months ago to start with that, and already three years ago, uh, as a member of the Royal Academy uh, of Belgium, uh, I'm writing a book to be published at the class of science as soon as possible with name, who do you know? What, how to build now? Subtitle, why? Uh, it will be written in French because it's my oh, mother gosh. language, uh, mind you, uh, and will make afterwards a translation. And this is also due to the fact that uh, the, uh, my peer review uh, is basically uh, uh, French or Dutch speaking people. Uh, and uh, also because if you want to write seriously technical or scientific issues, you better do it in the language you master properly. And after that, we'll make a translation in English as, as usual. So why do I speak about that? Because we are exactly so since World War II, um, Science and technology, very curiously, and has to do with the, the drama of this war, has been used urgently. Um, not really thinking 
what we were doing. So most of the construction post-war, post-1945, uh, are crude, to, to, uh, as simple, because we had no choice. No? Now, with the wealth going on, we might uh, think a little more about the quality of the buildings, uh, especially in, in relation with the environment. When I was a child living uh, along the, the River Lai in, in Ghent, I was playing with insects, birds, flowers, uh, uh, and there's something which has been forgotten. I'm so grateful to my parents who had the chance to be with nature uh, while uh, called by dad. In mathematics, physics, and to draw and to look at the flowers and the birds. Uh, I think we should all have this opportunity. I mean, that the building is that the first partner of a building is nature, and and um, it is so made. And because of the the growing uh, importance of cities, it is as if this this connection. Um, was granted that we a city should not uh, play with nature, which of course is a is very weird. Huh? But we uh, we have been used not to question that issue. Now we see, and this COVID nineteen story is a drama, of course, but it's also a magnificent opportunity to look at what we what do we want for our child, what do we want for us? Huh? Uh, just you know, we want to be happy, huh? and. Uh, you know, reflect to speak something. Uh, an office building in a, ref, a reflecting glass, glued with silicone and with air conditioning, is obviously not the answer. Eh? Although it's still being built, and that is really why do we build such unpleasant eh, uh, buildings, uh, such harmful buildings? Eh? But it's easy to say to critic. But when you meet the critic, say, how do you do it? How you are you able then to Try to make it better if you have this arrogancy. And of course, modesty is the first thing you, you need to have because it is not so easy to make a building without a silicone joint. Well, mind you, uh, we have banned silicone since years, and most of our buildings now are built without silicone. And to do that, well, you need to have battens. To make a flat facade without silicone is impossible. So, thanks God. The facade gets again a thickness, you know, like Gothic churches or Gothic buildings. Eh, probably the Gothic period was the most civilized period in building um, reflections, eh, uh, much better than the Renaissance, by the way. And the, the, the ability of putting things together was mastered at the Gothic period in an unbelievable way. But we're so busy with all stuff. I, there is one architect I admire. Is he an architect? Is he an engineer? Well, a couple of architects, of course. But I think about Richard Rodgers. If you look at the buildings of Rodgers, and when he started making Bobu, people would say, what is this weird stuff? But 50 years afterwards, Bobu is still a very human building. And if you look, I was lecturing in one of Rodgers' buildings in the city of London last year, and next to the Lloyds. And I was just looking at this Lloyds building, and thinking, wow. Huh? This so-called high-tech building is extraordinarily humanistic because the scale is there. The details are correctly done. So the more we're designing, the more we start. You know what I was doing yesterday? I was uh, for a, we were designing the building of applied science of Brussels University now. And of course, if a building of applied science is not exemplary, then you die, of course. And this building <laughs> should be a manifesto of a trial of good building. Huh? And by doing that, we are maniac designing every concrete block huh, with the joints and then saying we're going to make it with lime cement so that students can dismantle the building. So we will not use plaster walls, but concrete block walls. And then you think about the door frames. Huh? Of course, you, do, you will not use a silicone or a plastic joint. You're going to use a foam. So that means that if you want to put a door on the wall with a foam, of course, you don't put the door be the door frame between the bricks, but against the brick, because if you put it between the bricks, you have to push on a very weird way the joint between the wood or the steel and, and the, the concrete block. So that means that all the doors will be applied. And crazy, isn't it? But this detail has huge importance on the construction details we're building. And mind you, I 
underestimate the detail, and that means that our nice Revit BIM model has to be totally reviewed because I was lacking thinking about that detail. So it is a permanent um, play between the general vision, the goal, the, the general shape of the building, and the general proportion, the way air, light is coming in, the way nature can invade the building, and then the dirty, silly detail of how do you make a good doorknob. Uh, that, uh, you see, that, so that's one example. I'm sorry to speak, uh, starting from the detail, but it's, a, it's, a, it's so exciting in our intellectual activity is that we have to go from the general to the detail at permanence. And every day, every, every half an hour, you jump from one to the other one. Thinking there is now um, a big fear about energy. Uh, uh, and um, people get confused about that. Um, just to uh, make you think, uh, I was calculating for who we know. Um, you know, we, we try to make zero energy buildings. And to, to do that, we use an unbelievable amount of gadgets. Uh, for example, uh, the, 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 the fashion of trying to recuperate the energy of the, ex the air getting out of a housing of an apartment. And to put this, those calories in the air coming in happens through an engine. Well, if you calculate the embodied energy of that engine and the lifetime of that engine, it's a nonsense because you will never be able to, to get back the energy you yes, spent to make that machine. So uh, only a few months ago, I was thinking, what is now the, to make a global figure, the embodied energy in a building? Imagine. And you make a common building, suppose it costs about 2,000 euros square meter. Huh? Then you say, okay, how many joule, kilowatt hour, will this building need to stand? You have two possible approaches. The one is uh, in the way of Michael Ashby. You know the book of Ashby? No. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, I don't know which British university is teaching, but mechanical properties of materials or something like that. Um, Michael Ashby, and he has, is the, he has made a lot of tables, log log, with two properties of materials. Uh, and he has clouds uh, for every kind of material. It's quite a useful book. Um, and uh, he added, it's, I think, a seven or eight edition now. He added last year a chapter about, about his energy. Very arguable. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, counter argument can be given to, uh, to the values he's giving. But anyway, is one of the first guy who has put it in simple words in the book uh, to evaluate. You know how many joule you need to produce one kilogram of steel or brickwork. Uh, and yeah. but then so, and have to know by the way that the notion of embodied energy has been invented, discovered by. Russian economist in the 30s, 1930s, uh, with a very idealistic socialist view uh, on the Lenin period, not the Stalin period. Uh, but it's amazing to think that we are now rediscovering something economists were looking at very seriously uh, in 1930. Uh. Yeah. So to define what is the real embodied energy in a building is Im impossible. Yeah. Uh, theoretically, but there is a practical way. If you think that the International Monetary Unit is not the euro, the dollar, the yen, the yuan, or whatever, but it is a joule, because every, you know the it's all energy. So it, you can to evaluate roughly the embodied energy in the construction. You can start on one hand by finding the amount of uh, megajoule, gigajoule per kilogram of cubic meter of material. Huh? Uh, and then... Yeah, well, actually, actually sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, well, actually, we're talking about the energy stuff of your building on at Etica as well. Uh, further on, is... uh, so I thought it is very interesting if we could go back to go, go back to the, the first design process of your uh, uh, project in Antarctica, and then we can talk about uh, the in energy of your project later on in uh, to actually see how it works in your Antarctica project, if that's I okay. I ask you one minute of patience to finish my uh, argument. Yeah, of course. No. <laughs> uh, because it is related, I'm okay. really in, at, the earth, at the earth of the topic. Uh? Yeah, exactly, yeah. because it, it goes back to the question how and why. Uh? Okay. So to make a long story short, then uh, uh, we to my papers to justify why. 
one square meter demands about 54 gigajoules per square meter. So this is a huge amount of energy that is more uh, than 200 years of common energy consumption. So that means that it's quite nice, of course, to reduce the energy consumption of the building, but that is really a detail in the global cost of building. That means that when you build something, you better be sure that it is there for a long period and the cheaper it is, the less expensive it is, the more virtuous you are. That means that there is a win-win situation making economical buildings at the condition that you design it in such a way that it has a chance to be there for a long period. And the only way to give that chance is to make a friendly building. Right? No aggressive building, no high tech, no power power, just something, and you and Netherlands are very cute in that, and you know that since long, huh? that making a building that be re reused for other functions uh, in the time passing is the best guarantee you don't have to destroy. You know, I'm talking to you from our old farm. Our office is in a farm built in 1830, nearly two, two centuries ago. Hmm. Uh, we bought a ruin and we didn't destroy anything. We just restored the ruin and we're here since 30 years and with a very low running cost and very low investment cost. You see? So this obsession of what is, what, why are we building, what are we building and things that should be friendly uh, uh, in, in harmony with nature. Uh, this is to answer your basic question, consuming minimum amount of energy by making a nice door frame, which I started to discuss with. You see, yeah. that's global issue yeah no, okay um yeah so before we start on the the also the details of energy and sustainability of your design in uh, antarctica um let's first talk about your design process of that um project so the the project of the princess elizabeth base uh, was built uh, commissioned in 2004 by the international polar foundation and it was built in uh, 2007 so had you worked on anything like that like uh, uh, before? When well, my speciality is exploring. So, you know, I'm always doing building I've never done. And I try to copy nobody and also not copying myself. So uh, every project is a new adventure. The only thing which is constant is this quest for logic, you know, huh? How do you make things just, you know, uh, reasonable? And sometimes uh, it looks unreasonable. You see, that's what is funny, huh? is that you can arrive to iconical buildings with a logical process. Huh? But this way on, not the other way on. Huh? You, too many buildings now are just based on an idea of a shape, and then engineers try to make it work. So my process is just the opposite. I think, how do I simple thing and say, oh, for example, I'll give you an example, again, based because I'm a specialist in going sideways in discussions. I got a nice engineer teacher at the University of Louvain in Belgium who came to me last weekend to build his house. And he has a magnificent piece of wood with untouched ground. So we decided, I told him, well, if you want to respect the nature, we put it on poles, like the Sarawak in Indonesia. Yeah, but he wants a swimming pool to train because he is a big surfer. Well, how do you make a swimming pool then in a piece of land you don't want to destroy? Well, the idea uh, is that you make a, a greenhouse in plastic with wood poles, and you put a big transparent plastic back on top of it in which you swim, uh, but your plants can grow under your swimming pool. See, got, uh, weird, right? And what is nice is this will be a very inexpensive swimming pool to build. Yeah. To give you an example. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, now to go back to Antarctica, to be clear, uh, uh, the the Alain Hubert, who is the, the explorer behind all that, um, uh, was busy with his uh, projects in Antarctica, working with consultants that were uh, used to make images and not buildings. 
in the meantime, also, he worked with my colleagues at the von Karman Institute of Fluid Dynamics, with whom I'm working. I, I'm, my thesis as an engineer 50 years ago was partly done at von Karman. So all my colleagues at von Karman are, are friends. Uh, so I know them well. And they, the shape of the building was, as a matter of fact, the conclusion of the wind tunnel test at von Karman Institute, which, by the way, is two kilometers from here. Uh, so I go there with my bike uh, quite often. Uh, and for many of our projects, because we do uh, use uh, the skills of those guys quite often. So the shape of the building was the conclusion of those uh, various approach, plus the idea of Alain himself and his wife, Gigi Amin, uh, of how they wanted to live in there uh, with that team. Uh, and, and then uh, some designers gave uh, a paper on that but with no idea how to build it. And this process, and then the contract of B6 was already in, and all the contracts were in. And after two years of um, turning around the object, they were nowhere. And uh, uh, excuse me, I don't remember the date, but it was somehow in March of that, of that year that Alain came in in panic, say, um, well, you know, uh, we are nowhere and I need to load the ship in November to go to Antarctica with the building in parts. So would you please uh, help me to design that building? Mm -hmm. And that's how it started. Huh? So I got a shape. Huh? The shape was about fixed. Huh? Uh, Alain and the guys from Borkaman had a very good idea to put this building on posts. Huh? For an obvious reason that snow would not pack uh, against the facade of the building, which, by the way, seems obvious. Huh? But yeah. for the moment, it's nearly only one of the very few buildings on post in the Antarctica. A lot of the buildings are just put on the ground, which creates a lot of miseries, a lot of danger. And some guys have died between a frozen door and between a pack of snow. So for safety reasons, to put the building on post is obvious. Um, so but the thing that that being said, how you do it. And I remember there's a very short story. He came to see me uh, morning, it was about 10 o'clock, and I had to go to, to, to a side meeting for the train station in Leuven. And on the way, taking the highway, I was thinking to the, 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 the warriors of Alain, and uh, uh, I thought I would make it in wood because I had to, uh, I had to design everything in, in two months' time. Uh, because if you let, it was the timing. Uh, so in the first meeting, I told Alain, well, you know, we're going to build that building fully in Belgium to be sure there's not a screwdriver missing, uh, and then pack it and send it in, in the Russian boat to Antarctica. So knowing the date, and I think it was November, uh, we say, okay, we, we build it somewhere in Belgium uh, a month earlier uh, to see, to check if it is if we haven't forgotten anything. Huh? And so we need to be, let's say, somewhere in September. Huh? And so back, uh, that means that we, we had to be ready somehow in June with the full concept. And uh, driving to Leuven, I remember I met a couple of years before a carpenter in Luxembourg, whose name Alain Lecoq, uh, uh, yeah, I'm first name Pascal Lecoq, pardon with company Prefalux in Luxembourg. And I remember a cute guy, you know, a, a good engineer obsessed by wood detailing. So in the car, I called him. I hadn't seen the guy since a couple of years. He, uh, Pascal, I have a good news for you and a bad news for you. The good news is that I will charge you to build the, Antar the Belgian Antarctica base. I say, what do you say? Yes. You're going to build for me the Belgian Antarctica base. The bad news is that you have to be in my office this afternoon at 6 p.m because we start the design at 6 p.m. this afternoon. And so he was there at 6 p.m., Alain was there. And, you know, we're using computers as everyone, of course, but we also use chalk and, and blackboards uh, to develop concepts. So we have computers, paper, pencils, chalk and blackboards and, and, and cameras and, uh, and, and uh, cameras and whatever. Uh. And so uh, say, how do we, build that thing simply. Uh, and uh, the same evening, uh, uh, having my uh, craftsman with me, uh, asked him if it was feasible for his machines 
yeah, because the timing was short and at a reasonable price. Yeah. And in the meantime, also, because it was a public uh, market, yeah, uh, I asked the office to print 2,000 pages of specifications. And I asked him to sign that because this was, it was a standard backup specification. Of course, we would find in that the specification we didn't need, but you had a lot of specification, not useful. But as I didn't know how the building would look, would look like, I gave him the 2,000 pages he had to sign eh, to be sure that administrative was okay. So that happened also the same day. Eh? <laughs> and I just pushed on the button printer <laughs> or that happened. And, and so the idea came very clearly to say we make a two thick uh, envelope uh, in, in plywood, uh, thick, uh, separated from 40 or 50 centimeter. I don't remember. Uh, we're going to put uh, polystyrene <coughs> foam <coughs> with gra graphite in it, the best lamp that we could have at the time. Uh, and then, and this was an idea of Pascal, how would we hold? Uh, simply the two wood decks together, and he had experiment the idea of those the round uh, wood stocks between, and his machine could do it. So say, okay, you have that. We're going to use your wood stocks, uh, and and uh, that was basic structure. And also, we had to think about, uh, yeah, the, the, and you know, it's all about very basic equation. By the way, yeah, uh, much too often people are rushing in R&D before the NI. Before research and development, you have to discover and invent. Uh, it's, it's hopeless and pointless to make research and development if you haven't, this is, this is not an answer to a discovery or an invention. Uh, so that was that day we were busy with the NI. Uh, how will we do that stuff on a short timing? So we had at the same time, and we had no time to make uh, Finite element analysis or whatever, of course, we can do. Huh? And I use my slide rule and PL square on eight H A uh, 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 and very simple equations, which globally is always applicable, even for a high rise or a suspended bridge. Huh? And by doing that, giving the size the main glue lamp element. And mind you, the same day, all the dimensions were given, and it's it, maybe I was wrong at five percent or ten percent. But the issue was so important that it didn't matter. And so we had the structure uh, clear. Now we have to support the structure. Uh, and then, I, uh, very simply, I mean, the most basic that you cannot imagine, I, I did design those trestles in steel. Uh, and of course, a uh, round tube is the best for the buckling and the less expensive. Uh, so, very quickly, being used to design steel structure, I made a sketch of the steel structure. Which was, of course, not for Pascal Lacroix, but from the guy from B6 uh, and the steel contractor. Uh, so that was a site for a text meeting to discuss with the steel guy how we would be able to produce those trestles. Uh, and then we had to make foundations. And the first idea we, we didn't uh, apply was say, well, let's bore holes uh, and let's use ice as foundation material. Uh, because ice has uh, frozen water, has a bearing strength. Uh, so we made some tests, uh, but after a couple of days, uh, we, we, we had to abandon the idea, which might come back. And uh, Alain, uh, we had some experience, said, well, I'm going to pour concrete for a whole, uh, but pour concrete with low temperature is not the obvious thing. So we made, uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, you know, in, in scientific world, friendship is quite important. Uh, so you have colleagues at university, many of those, and you have a couple of phone calls, they will you think, can you make a test with ice? Uh, 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 can you make a test with concrete? Uh, what is the temperature? So all those, you know, this teamwork, this uh, network was on the way the same days. Uh, and uh, having all my colleagues, and I should make a list of all the, the colleagues who kindly uh, helped me in being sure I was not crazy with the idea, uh, we finally decided that yeah, in a couple of days, that allow would bore holes, yeah, bore concrete, put some heating system in it so that we assured the concrete was not freezing. Yeah. First operation, then trestles, then building the, 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 the building. Now, the, the issue was that uh, it has to be totally prefabricated, uh, loaded on a Russian ship 
the Polo Foundation had already reserved years before because you don't have a ship going to the South Pole like that. You have to be sure the ship is available. And by the way, you also may have huge storms eh, that might block the access. Mm -hmm. And it is not a detail, I'll tell you, because we are continuing, we are making a new project on the South Pole for the moment. Eh? And we have been blocked by a storm. Eh? And uh, a very important sponsor could not go to the site. Eh? And it was in January, just before the COVID. So uh, all those things are part of the design process. You have to think about accidents eh? and inconveniences of any kind. So uh, aware of that, we were just saying, how do we make it simple? And we, we had no, uh, no right of being uncertain of things. So if you may not, if you have to be certain, of course, you do take sometimes very conservative decisions eh? because it's mm -hmm. uh, fundamental. Uh, so the, the idea came quickly to make those elements, and you've seen pictures of those prefab elements, eh? and try to make them as similar as possible. Now, after that, with the, the drum of the, the cladding of this structure, eh? it was. Oh, can I uh, quickly uh, still clear, uh, ask a question about the uh, the Anchorage, because uh, I wasn't quite sure how it worked that you uh, told, uh, just told, because it's anchored on granite rock, right? Yes. So, and then you uh, drilled into that rock? Yes. And then poured and then in the... Or in concrete with your reinforcement and having a steel plate uh, on which the, the, the trestles were bolted. Okay. Huh? And then the how, how, how does it uh, stay um, heated or... Because well, of the ice. How, how, how did, I didn't remember, but Alain, um, uh, you can interview him about that. I, 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 he heated with hot water, uh, with a tube of hot water, like a radiator, uh, and to be sure that the concrete would, would not freeze before hardening. Uh, very simple technique, you know. Uh, he, uh, the, 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 the builder was Alain himself. He was on site, he was directing the construction. And because of his experience as an explorer, having lived in the South Pole and North Pole for, for months, having made in, unbelievable treks through that, he was quite aware of all the dangers. And the, and the, so his contribution was fundamental. I mean, his knowledge of uh, as explorer was fundamental to be sure it would work. So that was his credit and his part of the game. Huh? I was only his technical support, would I say. Yeah, because you yourself, uh, you weren't able to go to Antarctica. Pardon? You yourself didn't go to Antarctica for this project. Oh, I could have gone, oh. but I, the cost of the airplane ticket was 5,000 euro. Oh, yeah. And and I, I uh, although I always want to see the sites where I'm building, I thought it was unreasonable to spend that money because yeah. my added value of that trip, Alain being there, was zero. So I have never been to Antarctica yet. And for a simple reason, say, why should someone spend so much money to have me as a tourist there? As of course, I have all the data on my computer. Huh? And mind you, during construction, huh, I, I was live seeing cameras to see if it was okay. So I made a side yeah. control from my office here in Brussels huh, with a cellular of Alain. Huh? Lovely technology, right? Now, yeah. the, the, the next design issue, and it was not a detail, was how do we clad this insulated structure from the outside and from the inside? And then looking at what were the accidents that occurred in the past on all the existing buildings. Huh? And mm -hmm. uh, first, condensation and rotting of the buildings or corroding of the buildings. So we had to be sure that we had from the inside a con continuous vapor barrier. And when, I mean, really a continuous vapor barrier. I mean, the smallest hole could be a drama. And that means that from the inside on, we have glued on the plywood to alu-craft sheets. See what I mean? It's a sheet of aluminum on craft paper, huh? uh, which has a, which is a, a nearly an absolute um, water uh, vapor barrier huh? glued on each other. And then for the acoustic reason and the comfort inside, a woolen felt uh, attached with scratch, huh? 3M scratch, you know, uh, 
you are using for your backpack, huh? and this for the inside. And still, they, and we have done that so that you could remove the felt to check every year it was not a problem in the vapor barrier. Huh? Now, that being said, what happens when the 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 the, the pack is resting on the glue lambi? Huh? How will they, uh, well, mind you, on top of the steel be oh, on the wood beam. We have put a large steel uh, uh, plate uh, getting out of the beam five or ten centimeter, just to glue the the alucraft on it. So the, the vapor barrier is done by two alucraft plus steel plate, and also the where the steel plate was bolted, uh, screwed in the glue lamp beam, we had to be sure that at that point we would not have a flow of vapor. See? So, of course, again, then our DNI, r &D has been the detailed calculation of the vapor flow in the complex. Right? So, from the inside, we had theoretically no vapor, no water uh, risking to, con to condense in the, 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 in, in the complex of the, the envelope. Then, outside. Well, uh, in uh, major storms, sometimes you have flying rocks, uh, and the flying rocks might destroy, uh, with this kinetic energy, uh, uh, quite a lot of things. So, just thinking about the, the middle aged warriors, uh, I think we're going to make a shield out of it. So, we will cover that building with steel plates. And if you see, there is no one other Antarctica building with steel plates in it, which is also for me quite weird because this is the most simple uh, uh, solution and an expensive solution and low tech solution to uh, get a shock of a flying stone on the thing. And that's the idea. Now, between the idea again and now we do it, uh, it's not so obvious because. Doing that, you have to be sure that this steel plate is not blocking the vapor flow. So, and this steel sheet is not waterproofing. So we had to first on the plywood put it EPDM, I think, uh, waterproofing membrane enveloping the wool stuff uh, with a felt underneath it to be sure that if by any chance we would have some uh, vapor and it, it would fly away, then on top, the felt, EPDM, another felt, and then the, um, the, the bolted steel plates. Huh? With, of course, the, the danger of having water infiltration with, where the steel plates are screwed huh? in the EPDM membrane. Huh? And we have had some problems with that huh? because it's impossible. Now, if you want to make some a mechanical fixing, you can invent whatever you want. You have weak points. But I don't know how many years ago is that thing done, 14 or 15 years, it's still there and without troubles. Huh? So I, I think I made my job and I'm happy it's working. Huh? Uh, but And then you had the glazing units, huh? which had to be limited, huh? and then all the energy story. Huh? But basically, uh, the, the story of that, it's, I resume the thing. And then, uh, and then it was really, and i very thankful to Pascal Lecoq and his team, um, I think two months after the first sketches and the drawings, and then of course, with a lot of you know the army was busy with putting, producing the drawings, uh, we 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 went to Luxembourg to see the mock-up, the first element. Alain was in the South Pole, I think, that day, so his wife Gigi was there with us, and we checked with Pascal and his crew, my crew, uh, all the latest detail. It was all very useful, and but. They were perfectly so. There were very little remarks, and we were able to produce the wool stuff. And then we built the wool stuff, including the steel trestle, into a taxi in Brussels huh, uh, to check, and it was very. Of course, there were some details we were we had neglected, huh? but imagine all the the wood box to be put on the ships were there, so. When the building was built and dismantled, all the boxes were numbered, and the trucks are just to bring it to the Russian ship and to go on site. That's a simple story. 
Yeah, I played the contractor. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, but uh, you talked about all this um, uh, uh, protection. It's very interesting that you uh, said that actually, because I was wondering um, uh, that it's uh, yeah. You said that it's so obvious that you uh, y use these materials, uh, but the Princess Elizabeth base is actually uh, placed uh, more land inwards, which is not that usual for. Uh, Antarctica uh, bases because uh, near the sea, I believe the climate is um, more favorable, I guess. Is it really that, uh, it, is it, do you know if it's that much difference if you place it inward or do you need like such protection as you just described everywhere on the, the continent? Uh, uh, th 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 that's another issue. Uh, not really. It, it, it is, you know, and uh, allow me, I have no comments to say on that, that is um, the negotiation for getting his place on the South Pole is quite a diplomatic adventure. Eh? Mm -hmm. and, and I, of course, also get got the credit eh, to have been able to carry all those negotiations with all the international institutions who are caring for the South Pole. Eh? So it, it is the, 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 the place where you can build is the result of a lot of negotiation between countries. Right? And uh, the, the only thing, and then I was quite right, is he wanted a granite rock to put the station. Because to put a station on ice is always troublesome. You cannot imagine to have something without trouble on an ice support. I mean, it, it's like a boat. I see, no, it's not a boat, it's, it's a planter in your back. But, uh, so, the, 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 you see, and I go back to uh, uh, Palladio, uh, in the four book of architecture of Palladio, which by accident, uh, on the recommendation of a friend, I read, you know, uh, the book of Palladio written in 1560 was translated by a French monk in 1640. Mm -hmm. And so you have a French version, which is perfectly readable of the idea of Palladio. And it's amazing to see Although he was less subtle than the Gothics, obsessed by the Roman style, uh, Renaissance, back to Romans. Huh? But yet, his obsession about buildings, you know, the way you should build properly. Huh? And it starts with the, the, the choice of the piece of land. Huh? It's really back to basics. Uh, you Putting a building, it's always negotiating with uh, earth or rock huh? and water flows. And so the, 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 the choice of the rock is fundamental. Now, the, the new project we're studying in the Antarctica is, of course, also on the rock. And is also the Credit de Valais to have been able to agree to negotiate, to, to receive a site, to be allowed to build uh, on rock. But that's fundamental. And it's really part of the success of the story. And pardon, you also have huge catabatic winds. Uh, so you have storms, eh? um, but you know, uh, being 300 kilograms square meter, 100 kilograms square meter, doesn't make a difference. It's just you know, uh, uh, what is important is that the geometry uh, to make something withstanding, you have the material of course, but the geometry is fundamental. Eh? So think about a reasonable geometry, you know, having lever arms which are large enough, elements which in normal condition works at very low stress, but are able to cry under extreme loads, uh, like typhoons in Japan or in China, as we, we face in other projects. Uh, so it's just back to basics. Yeah, uh, do you actually think that uh, all of these things that you have to consider um, in this climate and all the materials that you need to use if you actually wanted to survive there, if it's still sustainable to build on Antarctica, actually? Yeah, well, that's, that is the why. Huh? Why, for damn God, are you invading the Antarctica? Why don't you leave Mother Nature alone there? Huh? Mm -hmm. huh? Well, the, the, that's, a, that's a real question. The, the 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 only feasible uh, allowable answer is for scientific purpose. Huh? 
of course, I think nobody would accept the idea that you go to Antarctica to drink, to drink, drink drill a hole to get oil. I mean, you would have killed them, but I mean, the South Pole is a treasure for humanity. Yet, we have to be very careful not to be too many there. And um, the, the, so, the, the, the being on Antarctica has, has only one reason, is to learn about our planet. This is the only reason. And, uh, and this is why, uh, so it, those are research stations. Uh, those are um, uh, shelters for scientists. Uh, we have to not to leave garbage on the site. Uh, and by the way, this is another reason why I would not accept uh, to build a building in Antarctica, which is not on trestle on a post, because you should leave the soil untouched, whether a rock, ice, or whatever, because all the microorganisms you find in there, in the in the story of the of the planet Earth, huh, have to be untouched so that you're sure that when you take a sample, you have a valid sample. Yeah. It's it's it is it is a we have to be very modest, shy, and careful by doing that. Huh? Yeah. So indeed, yeah. I'm I'm reading, and uh, I was a couple of uh, last year at a school in London about the, the, what's going on in Antarctica with my colleagues from a little bit all over the world. Say, guys, don't put the building on the ground, put it on posts because on the ground you're just against the, the thing you're looking for. And yet. Yeah. Amazingly enough, except the British one and no project, all the other buildings are on the ground. And yeah. it's, uh, um, it's very interesting um, because, you know, there is no point to moralize and say you're better than the other ones. But do you remember when the Americans were dreaming of making a biodome in Antarctica with a inflated ETF foil like they were doing the uh, American pavilion in Osaka in the 80s? I believe I read something about it. Yeah. Thanks God they have not done that. Huh? Because that would have been a shame, yeah. a very unacceptable colonization of nature. Yeah, but also it's... Yet, uh, yet I was bluffed at the time when I saw that. Huh? Yeah, well, it looked cool. <laughs> but, yeah, but we're also actually uh, talking to Hugh Broughton. I don't know if you uh, have heard of him. Oh, Hugh Broughton is the... Hugh Broughton? He's uh, like a, an architectural firm in the UK, and he uh, designed the Haley Six Station, and uh, he's now working on the. Oh, yeah, Burton, Yeah, of course. Of course. Yes, those we, are also. We, on, yeah. uh, we, we, yes. we 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 were together at the A School last year. Yeah. yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, well, we're also interviewing him, so. Of course, we talk to each other. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> you have to. All but, uh, the, you you and me were the only one who made the station post. Oh. Huh? I, oh. Uh, as far as I know. Oh, that's interesting. Um, uh, do you actually think that's uh, something I wonder if it's still going to be possible then with all of the um, resources that are of, of the earth that are sort of running out now, um, if it's going to be possible to keep um, building stuff on Antarctica in the future or well, these buildings that you and uh, well, I think maybe you and and you uh, both designed very sustainable uh, buildings that will last a longer time on Antarctica. But how do you think that it will look in the future when uh, we have to have different technologies, maybe, and different materials? Say that again. What is your question exactly? Uh, now, with all of the resources of the Earth and uh, climate change, that yes. we might have to have different technologies and uh, for the built environment, and maybe we can't build anywhere with too much steel or something. Uh, would it still be possible to to build on Antarctica, or how would it look? How many things would be possible still? That, that is a very, very, this is the why question. Why should you build the Tataka? And yeah. we already that, that issue. Well, the only reason, uh, the only justification of putting something there and being sure researcher would not die in uh, an unacceptable circumstances is for scientific research. And mm -hmm. after all, when we will know enough we better get out of Antarctica and dismantle everything and leave all that stuff to nature. Huh? Now, yeah. and this, this is why, but I think this is a, just by the bare fact, that's how you can build there. Huh? You cannot imagine to pour 
a concrete hole. Eh? And I mean, well, you do have it sometimes, but it doesn't make sense. Eh? Mm -hmm. So you make dismantle things, eh? and for a certain period of time, eh? and then be sure that you can get back to the to the, the, the normal climate with all your stuff leaving the place intact. Yeah. How long do you actually think that uh, your building might uh, last on uh, Antarctica? Um, how long do you think actually how long the, the Princess Elizabeth station will last? It's now been there 15 years. Give me your crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, um, we, we are now uh, in the process of designing a very large dismantable building in Antarctica. Uh, to be permanently um, inhabited, uh, which creates a new issue: is how do you survive in the in the Antarctica winter? Uh, and, yeah. and and there is one other interesting reason: is the the the, the study of the bio and and. Uh, uh, Biologic, the botanic and the biologic environment. No? So <clears throat> to bring very uh, questionable bacteria in Antarctica. But people have arriving there are arriving with their own bacteria, right? No? So let's face it, you already have put weird bacteria in Antarctica that were, for which Antarctica was not used. No? But that's not be too much, uh, you know, Moralistic about that, huh? and the issue is okay. Would there people who are going to live there year long, like some guys are in in, uh, in, in the space? Uh, uh, some guys goes to the moon. It's about the same story, huh? Uh, why? Huh? Well, you know, this is our quest for understanding better the planet, huh? and then the idea of making a biodome huh, makes sense. But yeah. it is pure exploration. And does it make sense? Who knows? Yeah. Actually, uh, when, because people actually do have to live there in the, in the, in the winter, and there is no sun on Antarctica in the winter. Did you also implement something in your design that will um, help for the mental health of the researchers and people who have to be there? Uh, absolutely. And I'm not uh, in. in I'm not allowed to make it simple to go yeah. in more detail about uh, this project, although a cute uh, Swiss scientific journalist uh, has published, we don't know how, an article in the French magazine Le Monde on the project. Uh, uh, but even I will not send it to you if you want to have it, go to Le Monde uh, because I, I promised that I wouldn't disclose anything okay. about it. But uh, in the meantime, we are building a theater in Rovaniemi on the Polar Circle in Finland. Uh, and there also, uh, they have a black winter. Uh, yeah. So the Inuits uh, uh, in uh, northern Finland or northern Norway uh, uh, just live the same way as those researchers. So we learned very amazingly enough a lot with our project in Rovaniemi. Uh, uh, seeing those uh, Finnish guys in the black uh, six months a year, how they live there. And uh, that's why you know, it's so exciting to have projects a little bit all over the planet. I'm, I'm building a little over the planet, a little bit, but enough to get an idea from a, a project in, in, in tropical China, uh, a project in, in, on, the, on the polar circle. In the, I mean, the, our project is really on or a circle line from here. Yeah. Uh, and so it's just, you know, uh, it's doable. Huh? And people have been since millennia have lived, Eskimos are living uh, out the year in the dark. Huh? So see how, how have they organized their social life to make that enjoyable? And your answer, just go to the Inuits in, in uh, above the, the, the polar circle and you have the answer. And that's what we are applying on the other side of the planet. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. So have you been there with the in which for this project? Or Pardon? have you been to the polar circle the, over there for the for this project of the theater there? Oh there, yeah, I'm there very often of course. Yeah. Okay. And and we just and we just got 
yesterday the final building document so we're going to start and if you go on a website you will see it it's a small theater uh, in Rovaniemi. Uh, it's a very exciting project oh, yeah cool um okay so uh, back to the elizabeth station so it's a zero carbon station it's the first uh, zero carbon station of uh, on earth i think no yeah of Antarctica. yeah so uh, what kind of things did you implement in the design uh, like what kind of services needed to be uh, uh, provided and how is it made zero carbon? Well, uh, first of all, this part of the design was handled by Alain himself. Mm -hmm. He is also a civil engineer and a very knowledgeable civil engineer and interested by energy issue. Of course, we have also our knowledge and new project, we are busy with the, uh, the energy story. So to make a zero energy building is so mundane. I mean, I know everybody is making a big fuss around that, but mm. that's just basic understanding. And okay. it will be published. I don't know. You can ask Wendy in which uh, book uh, uh, or proceeding it will be published. But it is a printout 1,409. Uh, you know, I have it here. Uh, and the title is reducing the carbon footprint at the Princess Elizabeth station. And the other article is called, where is it? I don't have it here, uh, minutes. Anyway, I, I made a calculation, a global calculation uh, of the energy needs, uh, not speaking about the embodied energy, the energy needed to run the building and to maintain the building, uh, because that is very important. Uh, uh, that, that I can tell you. I mean, because there was already the idea, you know, uh, inventions is a, a continuous process. Uh, so the the idea from the guys of Uncarman of this thing on board before I came in uh, was a good one for other reasons, which I discovered lately making detailed calculation. The ideal shape for a building to have the minimum amount of energy with the prevailing wind is to make an ellipsoid. This is the, the best compromise. So the, the, our, our projects, there will be, that is known, will be something that will look like an ellipsoid. So it is next step because the Princess Elizabeth is little square. And by, because of the drag factors, they, they have influence on the embodied of the structure, but also on the consumption. So, uh, and trying to use daylight when you have it, uh, you know, the, the, the um, solar panels makes a lot of sense. Uh, uh, it's amazing. Uh, if you look at the, the, in Brussels, you have about 1100 kilowatt hour square meter a year, perfectly 37 degrees on south. But you still have 30% of that energy, that means 300, 300 kilowatt square meter vertical in the north face. So with the cost of the photovoltaics now, it makes sense to clad the building in Brussels, the north facade with photovoltaics. Huh? Huh? So of course that being said, and for Rovaniemi, we made also the calculation. And that's amazing because Finland has nuclear power. And because they have nuclear power, they don't need photovoltaics. And by the way, the way the Chinese and the Indians are developing safe nuclear energy uh, uh, makes that it makes sense. And of course, there's a big argument about, you know, uh, nuclear energy is a very new technology. Uh, it is not 70 years of age, so it is normal to have accidents. When you, mm -hmm. we're building the first ships that were going to <coughs> South America, <coughs> starting from Spain, they lost a lot of ships, a lot of deaths. Huh? And so if we modestly accept that scientific development have unfortunately always casualties, same with airplanes and the amount of airplanes that crashed, huh? it is not that reason that we have stopped to make airplanes. Well, there is this kind of fear about nuclear energy for the moment, which is not healthy. Huh? The, 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 the issue is how to make, how to get nuclear power safely and sustainably 
And this is the way the Chinese have taken the lead for the moment. And it's a pity that Europe and the States are so backwards. And the decision of the European Commission on that are not a wise decision. They are, you know, beliefs. Huh? So, uh, but probably the most logic thing would be to go with a small new generation nuclear reactor. That is your energy. But this is, you know, saying that I excommunate it automatically. Huh? So it is not in the mood, uh, uh, in the, the the taste of the day. Huh? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, but that's amazing because probably the most obvious thing would be to put a very small Chinese nuclear reactor there huh? with all the safe condition that would make it, of course, zero energy huh? and and much more. Uh, anyway, that's so that's an issue. See about the why. And you have, uh, it is an open discussion, and I'm saying I'm right, I'm just questioning this. Maybe we could, like, in the meantime, uh, what are we playing with? Photovoltaics, windmills, uh, uh, and uh, hydrogen to store the energy when it is produced and you don't use it. Uh, uh, it's, it's a fantastically moving item. To go back to windmills, for example, you might know or know, but we, we, we have invented a, a guide to windmill mass, which costs 20% less than any other windmill mass. We had developed that on behalf of the Group Suez in Paris. We have all the patents, international patents, proofing from the Gabanish law that you can imagine that the engineering stamps you need eh, before building a windmill mass are uh, enormous. But we have been shooted by the Danish windmill industry, who didn't saw with pleasure our windmill. So, although it is, we have proven it is less, more economical, less harmful for the environment, dismantable, that we can reuse all the old windmills with, with their mass, uh, weared out by fatigue. Huh? No one of my windmill mass have ever been built. So, I decided to build two of those, the South Pole. Oh. You see, uh, that's that's about that's the magnificent story about uh, engineering. Uh, and if you look at history of engineering, there are, and in the story of plastics, for example, uh, uh, the, the 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 time lag between a, a bright scientist having discovering a new plastic, and this plastic being usefully used. I speak about uh, uh, bioplastics, for example, huh? which are known since decades. Why damn God are they not used? Well, because there is an inertia of the industry, a fear about employment. The, the, the fear about unemployment is probably one of the, amazingly, and because history has proven that it is uh, stupid, the more you tackle energy at the condition it is good for human being and nature, are fundamental, huh? is always positive. So, uh, anyway, uh, th those things take time, uh, and 25 years is peanuts. Uh, uh, and, and one. Uh, so, okay. we, 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 we and, and also, for example, the, the um, you, you know, uh, a bright uh, inventor at University of New South Wales in Sydney invented vacuum glass about 20 years ago. Huh? It is a bright invention. You replace a seven centimeter thick chip of glass that was full of silicone and aluminum by a glass which is eight millimeter thick with vacuum between. When, when I heard about it about 20 years ago, no, maybe not about that, uh, uh, Nippon Sheet Glass in, in Tokyo had bought the patent from this crazy teacher at, uh, uh, in Sydney. And they have produced the spatia, the vacuum plant. Huh? Now it's taken over by Pilkington. So I immediately asked the guys from Tokyo to send me a sample. And this historical sample is now stored at the Belgian Royal Archives. Huh? And I, with that sample, I went to see the boss of AGC. And the guy just fell out laughing from his chair. They said, oh, this is really something. You are crazy. Nobody will ever do that. Huh? So I was very angry. I, left his office smashing the door, say, you're really a stupid big boss. And in the meantime, we won the competition for the new headquarters with a new big boss. 
and uh, the meeting, the first meeting, I told you, you know, I'm not sure I'm going to make your building, except if you think about vacuum glass. Mm -hmm. And then the new boss told me, you know, I was in the office when you had this argument six years ago. Of course, we're going to develop vacuum glass. And now, thanks to a young, bright engineer in Tokyo, ATC is producing vacuum glass without a, a small inlet to suck the air. It's uh, uh, cer a ceramic edge. Do you want to see it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. I have the other historical sample. The first produced at AGC on the world. I, I take it. I'm coming back. One moment. That's it. Cool. And this has a U value of 0 0.7 watt oh. meter, meter degree K. And so the same as a, a such a glass. And this one is um, 27 October 2017. And this one is. I think it's a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> ah. Where is it? Uh, how do you see it? I mean, ah, where is this camera? Okay, here right, it is. Yeah. Voila, huh? there. Huh? And well, in the meantime, I remember a couple of years ago, still a big boss at ADC was telling me in the corridor, you know, okay, we are developing this vacuum glass, but you know, there is no market for that. It's amazing, eh? So in the meantime, they have built the first production line two years ago, and it's such a success that now they're building the third line. The problem is that it still costs 400 euro a square meter compared to 40 euro for double glazing. But that has to do with something about science with white rooms, because to produce the vacuum glass, you can imagine that you dust as an enemy. So you have obviously to work in the white rooms. And if you see the amount of uh, components good for the environment, this is a good example, which need to be produced in white rooms. The image of a factory full of dust uh, and smoke uh, is gone. The more and more factories will be white rooms. That means that the factory may be in your house and that you don't need industrial zonings anymore. If you see the thing. And about COVID, you know you have to work home now. Uh, so all this is mixed. Uh, and when you think about Antarctica, of course, of course, we will use this vacuum glass there for the new building eh? because the cost of transport becomes important. The CO2 print of transporting this glass is not a peanut, you see. We, and yeah. we, are, we are living in very exciting moments eh? where suddenly uh, people may imagine that an engineer might be also something, someone thinking about nature, biology and botanics. Yeah. Which I'm, of course, clearly in that vein. Yeah, yeah nice. Um, well, I think by now we uh, we have uh, uh, arrived at the final part of the interview. Um, so we have this uh, question that we ask at, at, at the end of every uh, podcast. And that is, uh, what do you think is the most important thing the students of today should know about uh, your, your the topics that we just discussed? And are there any other uh, topics that you think we should uh, gain more knowledge about? Uh, you speak about architectural students? Uh, yeah, architecture, but also uh, engineers in the... Okay, let's, let's separate the two, although the, the links are obvious. For the architectural students, the first fundamental thing is that they get rid of images. They concentrate on knowledge, tools to get the freedom of thoughts. Eh? Nothing is worse than looking at magazines. Eh? Look at nature, look at tools, look at human being, look at your your your, math, your maths, your chemistry, your physics, eh? look at philosophers. Eh? Back to basics. Just learn 
the fundamentals before getting distracted by images. Eh? The, the, this, this is fundamental. And to, to, to start with, there is a very famous Dutch guy, is Hans Dom van der Laan. You heard about? Eh? Hmm. No. no? Hans Dom van der Laan. He has written a plastic getal, the nombre plastico, eh? Eh? the nombre plastic in French. Eh? And it is, you know, you know about the Corbusier. Yeah, of course. This is useless because yeah. all the theory of Corbusier is just nonsense. But he was a guy quite um, talented using TV. So he has made a huge propaganda with very wrong concepts and ideas. His modular is something perfect for a two dimensional space, but architects are busy with three dimensional space. And Van der Laan, at the same time, Le Corbusier was making such a noise eh, that he was not audible in Valls, uh, in the Abdai of Valls, who he designed, wrote that fundamental book, which goes back to Vitruvius. Eh? And the, it, it is a proven theory. And it's a shame that uh, people are speaking about the Maduro in architect school without speaking of Van der Laan, because the Corbusier theory has never been demonstrated, nor by him, nor by anyone, eh? but Van der Laan has demonstrated that the ruling equation for space is phi q equals phi plus one, and not phi square equals phi plus one. Just think about those basic things, eh? because when you design, and the when you do that, eh? you make harmonious space. And when you use the golden ratio, you make nevrotic space, because you are not, we are not living in two dimensions, we're living in three dimensions. And I have, been, I have been cheated by that during years, you know. I, I, by chance, I heard about Van der Laan, and by chance, I could revise my position. And the most funny thing is, while doing an expensive building, I was using the Pythagoras triangle, which, by the way, is not known by Pythagoras, but by Chinese two millennia before, uh, three, four, five. And that is the consequence of Van der Laan. Uh, and it is so obvious to use. Uh, so, it, to cite one example, the other one, is that an architect should not be afraid of making calculations, basic calculations. You know, uh, how bright and friendly an engineer might be, he is not in the, in the head of the architect. Huh? And the engineer is based with R&D, the architect is based with DNI. It is the duty of the architect to discover and invent. Huh? The engineer might also do it, of course, but in a project, the, 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 the orchestra chef, the composer, is the architect. So he needs to have the knowledge to give instruction to the first violin or the first piano. If he is not able, the, the chef will be the piano player or the violin player. And exactly what you see now, uh, projects are architects and the, 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 this uh, competition system favors this lack of thinking because juries are looking at image, they don't have time to look at mentals. And of course, you know, you better, if you want to survive, you bet you better make a fancy image, whatever the logic behind it, you see? But that has polluted the, 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 the built environment. So this, this exercise to be able to seduce still being wise, which is not obvious, you see? So the, 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 for, i give you an example. This morning, uh, we, we have guys from a little all over the planet here and, and young ladies. And what is amazing is the difficulty for a young architect mastering Revit 3D modeling BIM perfectly to, to put quotation correctly on a drawing. Because of course it's is a 3D model, but finally on site, except if you work with robots, you have a craftsman who needs a drawing with dimensions. Eh? And the way the dimensions are laid eh, are fundamental because you can put quotation in a very, very bad way on a drawing that can lead to major mistake, if not accidents. You see? So it is act to basics. Eh? And I think the COVID story remembers that, that we, you know, don't bluff. You can bluff for a small period, but the truth will always come back and knock you down. Eh? So make simple things, but be sure when you are designing, dreaming, and please, young architects, young engineers, dream, make mistakes, 
be sure you're making a mistake because from that mistake, probably some right stuff will come out of it. But the worst thing to do is copy. The worst thing is to be impressed by something which someone else has done. Not saying you cannot admire a piece of art, of course. Eh? Admiring you could. I was thinking, telling myself my admiration for Richard Rogers' work, for example. Eh? But that's not why I, I don't copy Richard Rogers. He gives me courage. You see, if he yeah. can do it, why shouldn't I try to do it also? You see? Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good way to look at it. And um, the same, well, the same, yeah, for, the same for engineers, because they, they, they are martyrized with um, too complicated the mathematics they have to master anyway, but that creates a, a veil of obscurity uh, towards nature. And for example, computer science, uh, and now I see a lot of new young teachers in computer science uh, who are going back to do you tackle humanity with a computer? And it is possible, as long as you think about it. Think about the uh, RFID, radio frequency identifier. You know, there is no reason for a banker to make a safe if the money can be stolen with a computer. Huh? And maybe you don't know, but maybe some delicate uh, doctor has put under your skin a small RFID of 150 micron side and that you attract in your da daily life. So uh, there are so many um, ethical issues related to engineering and architects should be aware of it. Huh? I'll give you an example. It was very funny. Uh, we, we were invited to make a competition for a major bank. And I already, I already have a curious experience. I said, OK, I'll try again. And we ended up finalist with another uh, international firm of architect. And we were at the beginning 20, but we finally were two. And I proposed the bank a glass building with atrias and shops and uh, uh, crebe, uh, 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 I mean, uh, uh, societal functions. And the other one made the safe in concrete, beautiful object. And the young bankers were saying, oh, we should stop making bunkers. Huh? And I've been extremely, I have no acrimony at all. It has been a very interesting exercise. They've been very, very uh, respectful and correct. But finally, they, they choose for the sake. The image of the bank, yeah. we should have something solid huh, to protect that money, although it's an illusion, you see. And it's also important for an architect, a student, to accept the idea that there is nothing perfect. That's always a matter of compromise, and it is the beauty of the compromise which is important. I'll give you another, another example. Why for them do we have cathedrals? Huh? It is not reasonable to have a cathedral, right? Huh? It costs us a fortune, a lot of life to build that. But how beautiful those objects are. Huh? Yeah. The fire of Notre Dame de Paris has been a drama. Huh? And then think, just to take another French example, the, the, the new National Library of Dominique Perrault with the, the, the four books, more, more unreasonable than that, you cannot imagine. Because, of course, if you want to protect books, you put them in a black space eh, with a lot of thermal inertia and not in a thin tower, eh, which you have to put air conditioning in it. But yet, Mitran, it is just, it's rude to be right to choose this unreasonable product because the symbolic value of this national library is much more important than the additional energy you have to spend for that building compared to a more wise national library. See, we, 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 and if I look at my modest project, it's amazing to see which one piece people, and it is not necessarily the most wise, huh? but the most poetic, maybe. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, well, then uh, it's been a really, really a pleasure talking to you. Um, I think we've uh, arrived at the uh, end. Uh, I was just wondering because I, uh, I had like I saw this uh, documentary a, few, a while ago that was like a lot of ice melting in uh, Antarctica, and I was wondering like a very quickly like a large part of an answer. I'm not sure uh, by your part of, because I didn't really do the research, so I'm not sure if it's relevant. But I was wondering uh, if that really if that affects your design process, because the 
of the climate change that is like a large part of Attica is uh, melting very quickly. Uh, 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 of course, we, you know, again, we, we know very little about mm -hmm. all that, but just a normal scientist should only say, well, if there is a doubt, we just take care of that doubt. Eh? It mm -hmm. is too serious. Even if it, even if it would not be true, eh? this is a secondary issue. So it's the, the principle of uh, security. Eh? We and this is well underway. We have to take to tackle that issue of warming and CO2 quite seriously. I give you another example which hurts me a lot. Eh? Can you imagine the, the money humanity is putting in warships, in guns? Huh? Imagine now that suddenly the, Amer the American Navy, instead of fighting people with their boats, were just used to clean those plastic oceans. Huh? And that would be, for example, for an American president in the program, say, to the humanity, with our warships, we're not going to war, we will clean the ocean because after all, to take those plastic ocean for the American army would be, just be a joke, a nice exercise, wouldn't be? So maybe the enemy eh, for a big army is not human being, but themselves and the planet. Maybe the enemy is a plastic, eh? not a, not a, not Al Qaeda to say something. Mm -hmm. I mean, a little provoking. I see. So we we and we have, of course, and it it's a happening. You know, it's not a drama. Let's let's enjoy yeah. that. You see, have you seen on TV what's happening in South France? Uh, this, in, South, in Southern France, there have been uh, dramatic uh, rainfalls and in the nation. Oh, in, in, yeah, yeah. In, and, uh, and of course, uh, the, 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 the naive people who have built a nice pavilion of their dream uh, far from the old village, which is still there for, since century, if not millennia, have been washed out huh? and everybody knew that one day they're going to be washed out but you have that huh? and so uh, there are enough warnings huh, that it happens and it will happen uh, you know why should we do so crazy stuff huh? yet we still have business center with crazy skyscrapers with air conditioning and uh, silicone glued uh, reflecting glass and then you know, to make it nice, some crazy guys make twisted towers, you know, who cares for twisted towers? Yeah, yeah, I was just because uh, I just saw the documentary and I was wondering, uh, yeah. <laughs> but you see, yeah. um, just to finish, uh, to see how, how ambiguous uh, our lies of the world is. Mm -hmm. When the Impressionist Monet, Manet de Gapissau were proposing the Impressionist movement in painting at the end of the 19th century, they were snobbed by the Parisian intellectuals. And the, uh, the, the gallery, uh, Bertrand Ruel, was nearly bankrupt because he believed in them and he bought all the paintings from uh, Monet in particular. And nearly bankrupt, he had an idea. He, he took all the paintings, put them in a boat, and went to New York. And there, the ladies, uh, the ladies of those brutal uh, uh, industrialists making a fortune by killing Indians, by having uh, black slaves in America. Uh, imagine that with the money of slavery, of killing Indians, they have saved the impressionists because the wives of those crazy, brutal entrepreneurs uh, were quite an account and they, they, they were cultivated. And now, so, uh, America democracy, but they were killing a lot of people. Now you go to China with this guru. It is not good, of course, what's happening with this guru. But compare with what was happening in the United States, a so-called democracy, huh, under, under 40 years ago. Huh? See, and, and now what I discover is that my crazy idea about the vertical villages, huh, maybe you've seen the project I'm making for Positech and Sucho, huh, huh, I'm Telling that, you know, the first time coming back from MIT, imagine that, girls, in 1973, at the very handsome uh, uh, Royal Institute of Civil Engineers and, and Engineers in Belgium, in this beautiful palace, young guy, I was explaining to my old colleagues that 
we should make vertical villages that is make sense for urban planning. And they were just the uh, for it, uh, young guy. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your lecture. <laughs> but six years, I still making some serious theoretical work. But that you can go on the website, read the vertical city I wrote and the arguments I'm developing. It's only partial arguments. It is there is no truth in that, but at least as to open the question. Huh? And my first drawing of vertical porous building, you know, to make a, a high rise building, make it fat and hollow. You will and, and ensure that you have walks so that you can go with a with with a horse on the top of your tower and stop huh? and having some straw to get to your horse, huh? like the villages in Cinque Terre in Italy. Huh? So nothing new, huh? but I had to wait 50 years before finding a client that thought ah, that's what we should do. And it's in China. Huh? So 50 years ago, of course, the uh, young engineer, my dream was to go to MIT, so I went to MIT. But now I would advise a young engineer to go to Beijing, huh? to Shanghai, because that's where it happens now. Not anymore. It's crazy. Huh? And mm -hmm. the problem is that Chinese is quite a difficult language to learn. Uh, and Wordish, yeah, yeah. which we're using together now, is quite easy. It's not a language, eh? it's blah blah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, well, I think that concludes it. Yeah. Thank um, you very much. It was very interesting to listen to Yeah, it. I really enjoyed it very much. Yeah, I really enjoyed listening to it. My, my pleasure. Thank you. Philip Samin for recording this podcast with us. And to the audience, thank you for listening. The next podcast will be uploaded on Monday, December 7th. We will be talking to Pearl Chen on the subject of building methods and technology of the future and the influence of AI on our environment. All of our podcasts are available on our channel, on Spotify, YouTube and SoundCloud.